I would like to uh, turn to the uh, part of the program that I know everyone has really been waiting for. Um, uh, we, of course, at these events honor uh, members of our faculty who are retiring. And at the end of this academic uh, year, Professor Lillian Bevere retires after 40 years in law teaching, of which 37 have been at the University of Virginia. It makes me nervous to contemplate the law school faculty without Lillian because there is no one who better embodies what is most admirable about our culture. The combination of intellectual toughness with personal warmth and civility, the deep dedication to preparing our students for success in their careers and their lives, a belief in research and teaching as a collective enterprise, and insistence on putting the interests of the law school before personal preferences. Simply put, Lillian is the ideal colleague. Uh, she is also a remarkable person, and a remarkably lucky one, as, as you just saw. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the story of Lillian's professional life is one of avoiding the familiar and conventional at every turn in favor of the challenging and unconventional. Lillian was one of the uh, was, was really at the leading edge of the first generation of women to attend law school in more than uh, minimal numbers. She was one of five women in the Stanford Law School class of 1965. She was an outstanding student there, serving on the managing board of the Law Review and being elected to the Order of the Coif. While women were still a rarity in law schools in 1965, the profession's attitude towards women had changed somewhat since 1952, the year Sandra Day O'Connor graduated from Stanford Law School and was unable to find a job as a lawyer. Um, Lillian told me some years ago that when she graduated, she and her fellow female Stanford Law students believed that if they worked hard enough, they could do anything they wanted in the legal profession except become law professors. Uh, so naturally, Lillian became a law professor. <laughs> After a few years in practice, Lillian asked one of her former professors for career advice, and he suggested that she try teaching. She took the advice and began her career in teaching at the University of Santa Clara Law School. It will surprise none of her former students here to learn that she was a huge hit with the students at Santa Clara. Uh, indeed, Lillian makes a cameo appearance as the demanding uh, but kind and, and very well-dressed professor uh, in a biography of one of her former students, uh, B.T. Collins, a disabled Vietnam vet who later served in the California legislature and uh, in various administrative posts in the California government. After a couple of years at Santa Clara, Virginia invited Lillian to spend a year here as a visiting professor, which is the standard precursor uh, to a permanent move. She had every reason to remain in California. She had an enviable career at Santa Clara. She was also a single mother of two young sons. Naturally, she chose the more demanding path, driving east with her boys to Virginia. As Lillian once put it, uh, she was an exotic creature at the law school in the early 1970s, but she relished the challenge of meeting the demanding scholarly standards of a top law school. And meet them she did, becoming the first tenured woman professor uh, in the law school's history. Lillian promptly established herself as a thoughtful and innovative First Amendment scholar. Her early work ranged over the most hotly contested areas uh, of First Amendment law, including the constitutional status of non-political speech, the public forum doctrine, indirect restraints on religious practice, and press access to criminal trials. She also became one of the country's foremost experts on the application of the First Amendment to campaign finance reform. She is a consistent and prominent defender of the proposition that the First Amendment puts substantial limits on Congress's ability to regulate campaign finance, a view that the Supreme Court has come closer to in the Citizens United case. At the same time, Lillian became one of the law school's legendary teachers. The extraordinary affection that her students feel for her uh, is decidedly not the result of a lax, undemanding classroom environment. 
Uh, as one of her students puts it, her cold calls are reminiscent of the Spanish Inquisition. Um, but they are also illuminating and come packaged with such evident desire to see the student triumph that her students kept coming back for more. When we introduced the practice of having a professor selected by the students give a charge to the class in 2004, Lillian was the first professor the students honored with that selection. I could easily fill the rest of the weekend uh, with uh, uh, stories of students who have been so inspired by Lillian's teaching that they remember it years or decades uh, down the road. But let me summarize with a quote from an anonymous uh, student evaluation. She is brilliant, intimidating, witty, chic, commanding, terrifying, exacting, dramatic, cynical, beautiful, demanding. She's fantastic. I couldn't have said it better. Lillian's other contributions to the law school, the Charlottesville community, the Commonwealth, and the nation uh, constitute a full-time job all by themselves. Uh, Lillian, perhaps more than anyone I've ever known, lives the idea that our talents are here to be used in the service of the many communities of which we find ourselves a part. Uh, here at the law school, Lillian has offered her time and hospitality to uh, an enormous range of student groups. She has been closely connected to the Federalist Society and serves on its national board. She's been a mentor to generations of students. Uh, she's also served the Charlottesville community in ways large and small, from reading with students at a local elementary school to serving on the board of Martha Jefferson Hospital. Lillian's talents have been widely recognized outside the law school. In 1991, President Bush nominated her for a seat on the Fourth Circuit. Unfortunately for the judiciary, but fortunately for two decades of Virginia students, with an election looming, the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, took no action on the nomination. The second President Bush appointed her to the Board of Directors of the Legal Services Corporation, the nation's largest provider of civil legal services for the poor, and she served on that board from 2003 to 2009. But as any of my colleagues would tell you, cataloging Lillian's many com accomplishments does not adequately describe what she has meant to the law school. It is Lillian Bevere, the colleague, mentor, example, and friend we will miss. I hope that we will continue to enjoy that friendship for many, many years to come. I think I should have practiced my walk on water act. <laughs> uh, but I have a promise for you. Um, it's the same promise that Henry VIII made to each one of his wives. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't keep you long. <laughs> I'm going to talk about three things. A phone call, a decision, and how it all turned out. First, the phone call. The phone call um, was a real stroke of luck as far as I'm concerned. I was sitting in my office at the University of Santa Clara Law School. It was the winter of 1973, and the person on the other end of the phone was Richard Merrill from the University of Virginia. And Richard was calling to uh, invite me to consider um, an invitation to visit at the University of Virginia Law School. Well, um, 
it was a pretty easy invitation to accept, despite what Paul thinks it wasn't all that hard. First of all, um, I knew that Virginia was a fabulous law school. It was certainly several rungs up the academic pecking order from where I had spent my first three wonderful years teaching. Um, and so professionally, it was a move in the right direction. Um, personally, it was also um, came at a very propitious time in my life. In the first place, I, I did have two boys. I was, a, I was a single mother. But I was kind of worried about the way, um, what my children were learning about life um, in California. Uh, what I wanted was for them to have, um, uh, to, to have an experience of living in a place that had a past that could be embraced. <laughs> <laughs> and not just a present and a future. Well, I guess they're going to have to worry about the future some other time. But uh, in any event, um, I, I knew that Virginia, uh, if, any, if I knew anything about Virginia, I knew that it had a past. I'd even heard of Thomas Jefferson. So it was, that was one reason why the call came in a propitious, propitious time. The second reason, um, more deeply personal. Um, I, Michael, my now husband, and I had been going out together for about three years. And I was uh, um, seemed not able to find a way to persuade him that I was as essential to his happiness <laughs> as he was to mine. <laughs> so what better way than moving 3,000 miles away? <laughs> so I came to Virginia for a year and stayed for 37. <laughs> Michael and I have been married for 35. <laughs> He got the point. <laughs> uh, I tell you all that not because I think the reasons for my coming are all that important, um, but I realized that I had no idea at the time when I accepted the invitation and came to Virginia how how really lucky that phone call was. I had no idea I was going to get a $25 gift certificate to Courts and Commons. <laughs> <laughs> I had no intention of staying more than a year. Not a clue that I would make my life here. Not an inkling of how happy I would be um, or how deeply this community would sink into my bones. Uh, the law school has been good to me um, since the day I arrived. I was, I think, something of a curiosity at the time. I was divorced. I had two boys. I was a woman law professor. I had a nifty little 68 Chevy Camaro convertible. <laughs> and a very rambunctious black lad named Toby. But I was treated with just incredible kindness and generosity from the very first day I arrived. Um, my colleagues and their wives, and all my colleagues had wives because all my colleagues were men, um, but they treated, they were just so kind to me. They invited me to dinner, to play tennis, to go to football games, to go on outings with the kids. Um, it wasn't long before the boys and I realized that we had um, made some really good friends here, and we really did love our new friends, as how could we not? Uh, since I've been here, the law school has been led by <clears throat> several simply wonderful deans. I think our, our deans um, are widely regarded by people in the law school community, in the academic uh, community, as uh, the best law school deans in the country. And this is not just me speaking. This is something that uh, we hear from colleagues um, all across the country when we talk to them. Uh, you have the best deans in the country. You have the best dean, you have the best dean to be, you have the best dean, aren't you lucky? What's the secret? Well, the secret is people like Paul Mahoney and so forth. Um, Emerson Spees, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Paul, my Paulson was the first dean. Emerson Spees, Dick Merrill, Tom Jackson, Bob Scott, uh, John Jeffries, and Paul Mahoney. You just can't imagine how wonderful it is to be led by such people as these. Each one of them was just right for his time, uh, and each one of them was able to inspire the faculty to do its best work, uh, to lead us when we needed to be led, to bring consensus when that was what seemed to be called for. Uh, I believe that um, one of the reasons that you have all been so generous to the law school is because you too have been able to have confidence 
in the leadership that we have enjoyed. And that has, uh, in addition to the fact that you'd love the school, uh, that has uh, enabled you to part with some of your hard-earned money and give it back to us, which we appreciate. You have been extremely generous. We are very, very grateful. Now, in lots of ways, uh, the character of the law school has remained the same since I got here. But of course, the world has changed a lot since 1973. And the law school has, of course, changed as well. Uh, it, it looks different, for one thing. Um, we moved here in 1974, moving from Clark Hall. And that was a rather dispiriting move, I have to say, for, uh, for several years. But then, with your help, uh, we managed to get the law, the law Grounds project completed, and we've been able, for the last uh, 10 years or so, to live and work together in this absolutely wonderful space. Uh, Bob Scott used to say that he wanted a building that gave us all a sense of place. And I think he achieved that um, in spades. It's a wonderful place, a place in which to work. Um, so, that, so does the student body look different. Um, it's bigger. There are more students. Um, they're far more diverse. There are lots more women. There are lo it's a much more noticeable racial mix. And philosophically, uh, they range from one end of the spectrum to the other. And that's, that's really a wonderful mix. We're told by the dean each year um, that we've just admitted the smartest, most qualified class ever. <laughs> well, I suppose they're smarter uh, than they used to be, but I don't see how that's possible since they're so young. <laughs> now, a few things haven't changed about the students, and, and Paul made reference to these. Um, they're still just about the most attractive and um, engaging group of people on the face of the planet. They really like one another, and they're really good to each other. I understand why they're happy, because I think that this law school somehow or other manages to provide for them what, what we believe, and I think correctly, is the best student experience. Uh, at any law school in America. Um, my colleague Bob Saylor uh, teaches rhetoric, and he told me a story the other day that suggests one of the reasons why the students are, are so happy here. Um, he was teaching a class in rhetoric, and they start the class um, very, giving very tentative speeches. You know, they're, they're a little shaky, they don't exactly know what they're doing, and they give a speech every single week to the rest of the class. And then the last day, they each have had to memorize um, a speech about the best speech they've ever heard, or the best speech that's been made in the history of mankind. I, I'm not sure which, and I doubt that they're the same thing. Um, but, <laughs> but on the last day, when they gave their speeches, instead of all of them um, feeling like peacocks, and wasn't I wonderful, they were all crowding around Bob and crowding around one another, saying, you were so great, Just, I'm so proud of you. Wasn't she terrific? Isn't that wonderful? And they were praising one another um, with genuine warmth and kindness and appreciation to what they'd all achieved. And that's kind of the way the students are here. It's just, it's fabulous. Um, so let's talk about the faculty for just a minute. Uh, the faculty looks different uh, from the way it looked in 1973. Uh, oh, the hair, all oh, the bell bottoms. <laughs> Our younger faculty members are wildly better prepared than, than any of us were. Um, a lot of them come with PhDs. They've already written two or three law review articles, and uh, they really come quite ready to, to go. Um, in general, the faculty is more diverse. Of course, there are more women now, for which I am grateful. Um, but there's more of everything. There, there are people living all kinds of different lives. And the racially and, and philosophically, the faculty, too, runs, runs the, the spectrum. I've always thought that was one of the great strengths of uh, that, that we are genuinely diverse in in the, in, our, in the way we think about law and the way we um, approach uh, legal problems. A couple things about the faculty haven't changed. They're still wonderful people. Um, they're helpful and generous. They're good humored. They're excellent scholars. Most importantly, perhaps, from the students' perspective, they still love to teach, and they take teaching and their obligation to students very seriously. Um, and almost all of them are very good at it, and the ones that are not very good at it are pretty good at it. <laughs> but in all this change, there's been one constant. 
Um, the law school has held fast to its most important, its most important resource, and that is um, its spirit of collegiality and uh, uh, goodwill among the faculty, between the faculty and the students, and with the students with respect to one another. This tradition is probably the thing I love most about Virginia. I, I think it's actually what makes us great. It's an almost palpable presence here uh, among the students, between the students and the faculty, and, and within the faculty itself. You can, you can feel it. Um, on some law school faculty since 1973, um, there has been a lot, of, a lot of, let's say, civil unrest, uh, political infighting of the most really most vicious and, and destructive kind. Now, Virginia has just managed to uh, not to have to under, undergo that torture. And we have managed, because I believe of our spirit of collegiality and the good faith with which we um, treat one another, we've managed to, to sail a pretty smooth sea. Um, it doesn't, I don't mean to suggest we haven't had disagreements. Um, we have, but the disagreements have not by any means permanently put us into two warring camps. We've, we've gotten over the disagreements, we don't hold grudges, we move on, um, and I think that's because we trust one another and we have confidence in, the, in, the other, in our colleagues' good faith, and that just helps us to move on from, from one challenge to the next, and I think this faculty has, has done that um, remarkably well. The spirit of community is, is Virginia's trademark, and again, I think it is what makes the school great. During the spring of 1974, just after I had accepted the offer to stay here in Charlottesville, um, my colleague Warren Schwartz, my then colleague Warren Schwartz, um, said something to me that was rather unsettling. Uh, Warren was from Brooklyn, and he had um, he, he, at the time, he, he said what I'm going to tell you, he said to me he was still a little bit uneasy about his place here in Virginia. And he said, it's a great school, it's a great town, uh, it's a great place to be, but I promise you, uh, it's, a, it's beautiful. It was in the spring, and he said, it's beautiful. But I'll tell you, Lillian, they'll never be your azaleas. <laughs> Well, I think Warren meant that um, <laughs> you'll never really belong here. Uh, you'll, never, you'll never be a Virginian. Uh, this will never really be your law school. Um, you'll never be completely at home. Well, I'm here to tell you that Warren was wrong. <laughs> I, I have belonged here. I have become a Virginian. This is my home. University of Virginia Law School is my law school. It's the greatest law school in the country. Uh, and one more thing, they are my azaleas. <laughs> now I said I was going to talk about three things, um, but I have to say one more fourth thing, and that just is thank you to all of you. This is the hard part. <laughs> my friends, my family, my colleagues, uh, thank you for uh, letting me share my life with you or for sharing your community with me. I can't tell you how wonderful it's been. I tried, but I can't do it. <laughs> thank you very much.